And I think, and I know, I believe that African literature is worthy of this kind of prominence. You know, why should we be in a shelf in a, a room somewhere or in a dusty library somewhere? You know, when you come in here, you know that you're in a space that is a grand space. And yeah, this is what we deserve. We deserve more. Today I am at the Library of Africa and the African Diaspora. This fantastic place has hundreds of books that are from the continent of Africa as well as people from the diaspora. This is a, an amazing place. If you are an avid reader, someone who loves literature, somebody who wants to learn more about the history and culture and heritage of African people, of black people around the world, this is the place you need to come to when you're in Ghana. Even if you live here and you're not someone who's just traveling, you have to come here. You don't need to be a person from the diaspora to come and see this library. Ghanaians, you need to see this too. Africans, when you travel to Ghana, you need to see this place as well. So I'm gonna have a chat with a woman who founded this place and hear more about the story as to why she started this library. So you are the founder of this library. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful space. Thank you. You know, it's the perfect size. It's cozy yet spacious. Yeah. Um, what exactly made you decide to do this? So we've actually had a library for nearly three years now. We had um, a smaller space, much smaller, which was called Libraria Ghana. Um, and we were in a place not too far from here, actually, for about two years. Um, but we actually really outgrew that space very quickly. So I think within about six months of having it, we outgrew it. Yeah, I've been there. It was very small. Yeah, it was a small <laughs> space, but I liked that small space actually yeah. because I like to say that that was my living room and now you're in my house. Okay. Do you see what I mean? So it's an evolution. Yes. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, we outgrew that space. We were there for two years. And when we were looking for another place, actually, I wasn't looking to be in Accra at all. Um, I was looking to go outside of Accra to an environment that was much more let's say conducive for uh, reading and writing and thinking and that kind of thing. Um, and so I was looking in the eastern region, looking in the central region, um, but I wasn't able to find anything. And it just so happened that I found this perfect place in Accra, not too far from where we were before. And so, yeah, we've been here since uh, January of this year, but unfortunately because of coronavirus and everything else, we haven't been able to open fully. Um, we opened in July, um, but we're still not fully open. Okay, so um, this place opened in January, but as you said, COVID delayed things. Yeah. And how does it work? Because I know that there's public libraries, there's private libraries. Explain so that people understand exactly how yours is yeah. operated. So we're a private library, which means that you have to pay to be a member of this library. And we have two different adult memberships and one of them entitled, well, they all entitle you to borrow books. That's the important thing. Um, and the other thing I should say is that we are an African library. Um, we're called the Library of Africa and the African Diaspora. And our focus is on books by writers of African descent. And so what that means is, it means African writers, African-American, Caribbean, Black British and European, and Black writers from the Americas, wherever there are Black writers, basically. So that what, that's what makes us unique. It's the fact that we are uh, concentrating on um, African descended writers. So as I was saying, we have two memberships. Uh, we have one where you can borrow two books at a time, um, and you don't um, have access to the library facilities as such and you pay for the events that we do. And then we have a full adult membership where you can borrow four books at a time and you can uh, use the library facilities and come to all the events for free. And yeah, we have children's membership as well, I should say. Okay, so we have children's books too. <laughs> we do, we have a children's library, which is just over there. Okay. Um, we also have another room um, over there, which you, you'll see when we go on a tour. Um, we have uh, special collections and an archive room. And then we also have a screening room where we show films that are to do with um, African and black literature. And so those kind of films are either um, 
books that were adapted into films such as The Colour Purple, um, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, um, To Sir With Love, it could be any of those. Um, we also have um, films that are about writers, so The Art of Ama Ata Edu, um, and Still I Rise about Maya Angelou, the Toni Morrison documentary, etc. So yeah, we do all kinds of things. For the screening, how often do you do those? Um, well, they're on the every. Plan? Well, they're on every day. So when well, not every day, but whenever we're here. Okay. Um, so it's on a loop. So okay. when our members are in, they can you know just go in there and watch whatever is on. Um, outside of that, we also do public events. And so if you're not a member and you want to come to the library, you can come to any of our public events, and that includes film screenings as well. Um, author readings, book signings, discussions, um, you know, all kinds of activities. Um, and then we also do a guided tour. And the guided tour lasts an hour. We say it lasts an hour, but everyone has gone on <laughs> way more than an hour um, because it's very um, intense and engaging. And um, people who come, they want to learn about African literature and about the connections between African writers and diaspora and writers. And so, yeah, we take them on a whole tour of the compound and of the library itself and of the books and the writers and yeah. <laughs> and so what's the feedback been like so far since you opened this location, like migrating from having the smaller space yeah. to here, how have people responded? Um, the response has been amazing. Um, we have had loads of um, media and publicity that I could never have anticipated, <laughs> actually, but I guess the timing was, um, I hate to say fortuitous or right, but you know, obviously we're in the middle of um, a renewed Black Lives Matter movement, unfortunately. Um, and you know, being in um, this situation of lockdown as well, there's been a lot of interest about why black literature is so important and why a space like this is so important. And so, yeah, we've had the BBC, um, Al Jazeera, AFP, um, Business Insider, um, SABC, South African Broadcasting yeah. Corporation, and also the Mail and Guardian, South Africa. We've been in Le Monde, the French um, newspaper, and yeah, it's just been amazing, actually. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, it also makes me think about a story when you talk about the timing of the whole Black Lives yeah. Matter movement. I read a story about a, a Florida man who had a bookstore mm -hmm. that was all dedicated to black art, uh, black writers, yep. black literature. And he has been there, I think he said 30 years. Yeah. And he said, never has he been so <laughs> sold out of books like he is now. Yes. You know? So people definitely are more interested in reading. Yeah. But I think it's important for us to, to make clear that we're not just here for a moment. You know, we were here before all this happened, we'll be here after all this happened, and our importance doesn't lessen when the spotlight is off Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and um, Jacob Blake and, you know, everybody else who has been murdered um, by the state. It's really, really heartbreaking that it keeps happening, you know? Like, you just mentioned yeah, the most yeah. recent one. I, I just was in complete shock. Yeah. You know, there comes a point where you can't keep up anymore and I know that sounds terrible but it's really true like you remember or you know one name George Floyd and then there's another name Elijah McLean and then there's another name Jacob Blake and it's like who's it going to be tomorrow Taylor, yeah exactly yes yeah, Breonna Taylor exactly and so it's it's heartbreaking and it's exhausting for us as black people it is and it doesn't matter whether you're not in the United States or you're in the United States I feel as black people it affects us wherever we are and um, that is both the beauty and the pain of being a diaspora. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, with this library, do you find more people are interested in the writers who are outside of Africa or the ones who are in Africa? Yeah. The ones who are in Africa, definitely. And I think that works, or that's happened because when diasporans come here, they most likely don't know that much about African writers and so they're interested in learning more about you know the African writers but also it says something about our education system and our systems of um, oh what's the word oh, oh our systems of being that actually when Ghanaians come here and when Africans come here they also don't know that much about African writers e either and so they're interested to learn more and obviously you know I, I don't want to say the term cultural imperialism, but that's, I guess, what it is. American culture is world culture. Yeah, so, definitely. you know, so even a Ghanaian will come here and they'll have heard of Maya Angelou or Toni Morrison, but they may not have heard of Bessie Head or of even Ama Ata Edu and they're Ghanaian. Yeah. So, you know. That's so true. Yeah. That's so true. Um, interestingly, when I, I grew up in Canada, you know, yeah. born in Ghana, but grew up in Canada, it was a white teacher when I was in grade 11 
introduced me to African writer. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was Shinua Achebe. Yep. Um, it was No Longer at Ease. Oh, okay. I'm surprised it wasn't Things Fall Apart, Apart. yeah. He gave me No Longer at Ease. Yeah. He gave me that book. It was his own copy. Mm -hmm. It was like an old, old copy. He gave it to me and told me I should read it. Yeah. And it opened my eyes and I had this excitement. I was like, I can't believe that my parents didn't tell me yeah. about it. You know this author yeah but your parents probably had a very colonial education just yeah. as we have had being raised in the diaspora and just as Ghanaians today have been raised in Ghana it's you know true. very very true because when I used to work at SOS college mm -hmm. there were um, some students who said they wish there was more African literature in their, in their curriculum definitely so, and I'm I'm like you in the sense that I didn't have a teacher who introduced me to African literature I had to find it myself and so I went through the whole of school college, university, even though I didn't do English at university. But I went through my whole academic life not having read um, formally or officially an African writer. And it's interesting because um, one of my friends who was born and raised in Ghana, um, he came here and uh, he saw the things fall apart and he was like, I can quote you this whole first page. And so he started like reciting from memory the first page of things fall apart. And if you ask me what first page I can recite, I can recite the whole of Shakespeare's Macbeth. And I think that tells you the difference in the education, even yeah. though I still think the Ghanaian education and African education is very much geared towards uh, colonial education, but still I think most people who have gone through school will have read Things Fall Apart, which I never did. So. Yeah, I ended up reading Things Fall Apart after I read <laughs> No Longer at Ease, yeah. and I was like hungry yeah. for more. I was like, I gotta see, see more of yeah. these books. And but then I couldn't find them. That was a thing. And this is another problem. I couldn't find them. Yeah. And I think, like, once you see the rest of the library, what you'll notice is that um, we have a shelf that is called World Writers Shelf. So it's not that we don't have any non African writers here, but we have a shelf. And it says, you say, access is everything. Because if you go into a bookstore in um, the West, wherever in the West it is, and you say, oh, you know, where are the black writers? And it'll be on a tiny little shelf that, like this, and there'll be maybe five writers and they will most likely be Chinua you know, Echebe, um, uh, what's, uh, yeah, Jesse Homegoing now for contemporary stuff, you know. Chimamanda. Chimamanda, of course, Chimamanda and um, maybe one other yes. and that, that will be it. Yeah. And so this library is the complete opposite of that. When you walk in here, you know that this is a very African library and it's not just from the decor, it's not from, you know, just from the pictures that are on the wall, it's from the whole um, being an essence of what we do, so. Great. <laughs> and what do you see as the long-term vision for this place? Do you see yourself moving and expanding somewhere else or having multiple <laughs> locations? Um, definitely moving and expanding uh, within Ghana first at least. Um, multiple locations, um, you know I've had a lot of queries from people in other African countries, um, not even just with this library, with the former one that we had where they said you know I love the concept and would you come and do one here. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> about that yet, but definitely uh, expanding in Ghana. And I think, and I know, I believe that African literature is worthy of this kind of prominence. You know, why should we be in a shelf, in a, a room somewhere, or in a dusty library somewhere? You know, when you come in here, you know that you're in a space that is a grand space. And yeah, this is what we deserve. We deserve more. I love that you said it deserves prominence. Yeah. Perfect state. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about this space out here. Okay, so this space actually we call Makarere Square. Every space in the compound is named after um, a different African um, literary uh, concept. And so this is called Makarere Square, which is after the um, African Writers' Conference that took place in 1962 at Makarere University in Uganda. Um, but as you can see, around the compound we have um, different pictures of different writers of African descent. And so normally when people come here, I challenge them to name as many of the writers on the walls as they can. We also have um, two walkways in the compound that are named after different people of African descent who have had some kind of impact, not just on uh, myself, but on society um, as a whole. And one of them is Marielle Franco Way, which is just over there. And Marielle Franco is an Afro-Brazilian politician who was assassinated in 2018 at the age of 38. And so that's Marielle Franco Way. And then the other walkway, so the other walkway that we have is Walter Rodney Way, and that's this walkway around here. So when we walk around here, let me show you Walter Rodney Way. And so this is Walter Rodney Way, 
Walter Rodney was a Guyanese academic, uh, pan-Africanist, um, black nationalist and historian who's probably best known for his book How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, um, of course, and also The Groundings with My Brothers. And uh, Walter Rodney was assassinated in 1980 at the age of 38 in Georgetown, Guyana. So this way is Walter Rodney Way. The other way is Marielle Franco Way. The main square out here is Makereri Square after the university in uh, Uganda. Um, and then we have a space at the back, which is our main event space. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the video so far with this interview um, at the Library of Africa and the African Diaspora. There is exclusive content that you can see if you support me on my Patreon page. Just head on to the website that's on the screen right now, which is patreon.com forward slash Ivy Prosper, and you'll get to see a little bit more of an extended interview with her, as well as some exclusive access to the special collections where there are old books that you can't find the original copies of anywhere that are behind a glass case and she talks a little bit about those collections there so head on to my patreon and you'll get access to that information now back to the video so as you walk in you're facing our african writers shelf um, and we have books in this library by writers from 41 of africa's 54 nations and we're still building the collection um, and we have Ghanaian writers in the middle. Um, one thing that we definitely worked on building up is our Ghanaian writers. Um, we only have one section in the library that is not by writers of African descent, and that is this section here. This is what we call our world writers shelf. And so this is totally the um, antithesis of what you'd expect if you go into a Western library, for example, where um, if you go into Western Library and you say, you know, where are your black writers or African writers, it will literally be a small, tiny section. Uh, here we have a, a, I'd say a good se selection of world writers, but this is the only um, space where we have non-African writers. Okay, so it's non-African, but it's still black writers? No, it's non-African okay. generally. Okay, yes. all right. So generally any writers work. Yes. And how do you make the decision on which writer's work is included here? Well, actually, I mean, the whole library started with my own book collection. Mm -hmm. So these are writers whose works that I have read and liked. And so there is no, you know, it's, it's quality uh, literary fiction and narrative nonfiction. Okay. So that's the world writers. This is our African-American um, writer's shelf. Um, as you can see above, we have a um, portrait in the middle of Maya Angelou, the Queen. Um, who also uh, lived and worked in Ghana in the early 60s. Uh, next to Maya Angelou, we have Alice Walker. And um, on the far other side um, of Maya Angelou, we have James Baldwin, the king, the master, James Baldwin. But we have everybody um, here who you would expect. So, you know, Maya Angelou, Angela Davis, W.B. Du Bois, um, Bell Hooks, Tony Hussey Coates, Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, Lorraine, the, uh, Lorraine Hansbury, Alex Haley. Um, they're all here. They're all here. So, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison. Fantastic. Were you always an avid reader as a child? Yes. Um, since the age of three, I would say I've been an avid reader and it was always something that was encouraged by my parents as well. Um, and so, yeah, they would always get me books. <laughs> if nothing else, they would get me books. Um, so this shelf here is our uh, Black British shelf. So this is my shelf, <laughs> technically speaking. And um, on the top we have Sadie Smith, who's most famous for her book White Tea. Uh, Carol Phillips, the St. Kitian writer, um, who's also um, uh, British, he grew up in the UK. Um, Andrea Levy, probably the most, well at least in the UK, probably the most famous black British writer is Andrea Levy, who is best known for her book Small Island, which is about the Windrush generation. Um, and Andrea Levy unfortunately died uh, last year um, from cancer. Um, but this was her fourth book, and this is one that made her most uh, famous. And then Aminata Fauna, the Sierra Leonean Scottish uh, writer. And then here we have Bernadine Evaristo, who last year became the first black woman to win the Booker Prize with her book, Girl, Woman, Other. Um, and she didn't win it outright herself. She actually shared it with Margaret Atwood, but at the same time, she is yeah, the first black British woman to win the man Booker. 
So this is Caribbean. Yes, so this is Caribbean Writers Shelf. And as with the African Writers Shelf, we are trying to gather as many um, writers from the different Caribbean islands as possible. Um, at the moment, we're quite representative, but we could um, definitely um, increase and um, enhance the collection. So if we start at the top and with the writers up here, we have Edwige Danticat, who's the Haitian-American writer. Uh, Marlon James, the Jamaican uh, writer who became the first Jamaican and I think only the second black man to win the Man Booker Prize in 2015 with, for, this book. for this book, A Brief History of Seven, Seven Killings, which was about the assassination, the attempted assassination of Bob Marley um, in the 1970s. Uh, we have Maryse Condé, who is a Guadeloupian writer, and this is her se section here. And uh, she um, also lived in Ghana for a while and lived in West Africa for a while, and one of her books this is her memoir, What is Africa to Me, um, talks about that experience. What is Africa to Me? Yes, the great Marie Condé, who's in her 80s now and still writing. Um, and then Derek Walcott, the St. Lucian uh, poet who um, won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1993. And this is the Derek Walcott collection here. And so this is our Caribbean section. We have writers from all over, uh, from Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, St. Lucia, Martinique, uh, Guadeloupe, um, Jamaica, as I said. This is the special collection. So um, if somebody wanted to make a donation with books or with money, what do you prefer to help support your project here? Um, we accept donations of both books and money. Money is always good, of course, because then you can buy your own books and you can make your own selections, but also um, just to run the place. So yeah, we also do a lot of outreach work. That's something that I haven't spoken about that I think is very important. So we have actually four libraries. Um, this is the flagship one, but this is the only one that you pay for. And so we have three school and community libraries. Um, they are outside of Accra. One of them is in Nsutum in the Eastern region. Another one in Ashaiman, which counts as Greater Accra, I guess. And the other one is in um, Kumawu in the Ashanti region. And so they are totally free school and community libraries. And so any donations really goes towards supporting our outreach work. That's fantastic. Thank you. That really is fantastic. The young people need something like that. Definitely. I think the younger that you catch children, the better. <laughs> uh, so, you know, with our um, Ashaiman Library, for example, uh, we used to go there one, no, we used to go there twice a month to do reading and creative play with the children. And um, they are aged between, I would say, six and 14. And that's the perfect age to try to get them. Um, when we've done other outreach work and you have children who are, or teenagers who are 15, 16, 17, it's almost like they're gone <laughs> by that stage. And they're just thinking about how they can get money and work and things like that. And so reading is not a priority. So the younger you can get children engaged in reading, the better. Thanks for watching this episode of Your Guide on Ghana. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time. I see. I'm so grateful for the love I'm receiving. Love I need only to only pop.